Okay, so more models today. We're breaking up our models of conflict, the Lancaster and the Richardson models to talk about something totally different, the SIR model. And this is a model of disease dynamics. Um, so, sorry, I don't know what that pause was. The SIR model is a model of three, but really two variables. We actually talked about this briefly some time ago, just when I was trying to convince everyone that systems of equations are a real topic that matters, but I don't imagine or don't suppose that you remember that we've got people in the three categories and you'll have to forgive my spelling was always my weakest point. We've got people who are susceptible to the disease. We've got people who are ineffective, and we've got people who have been removed from the model. And excuse me, let's just make sure this isn't a job thing, it isn't. Um, so the way this model works, People start as susceptible. People who are susceptible can get the disease, and if they get the disease, they can spread it to other people. Um, so they can become infective. And after people have had the disease for a while, they are removed from the model. Um, the optimistic or the nicer option is that this is something like a flu, where you get it during flu season and then the disease grants the immunity. So once you've recovered, you don't get that flu again. But I mean, this could also be used to model fatal diseases where people are removed from the model by passing away. Um, this is a very old model, and it's one of the most influential mathematical models in the world, I would say, or in history. I mean, and what makes this model so influential is that it's incredibly easy to modify. You've just, you've got some compartment. And if you want to change the model around, you can add new compartments or you can remove compartments. So, for example, um, we might look at COVID. And COVID cannot be modeled appropriately using the SIR model because COVID does not provide permanent immunity to COVID. You can get COVID multiple times. So say I wanted to model COVID and this is just off the top of my head. We'll keep the susceptible people intact. We'll keep the infective people intact. COVID doesn't provide permanent 
um, unity, but it does, I believe, provide temporary um, unity. Sure. Apologies if I'm just spouting lies. I have not kept uh, up with this as much as I probably should have. So instead of a recovered category or a totally removed category, we'll have a temporary immunity category. And then after a time, people who have been temporarily immune are no longer immune and they go back to susceptible. And we can, because I do think it would be important in a situation like this, to, to look at people who have passed away, we can add a category for people who are deceased, for people who passed away due to this disease. And then we can add more categories, just as the situation warrants. So, People can become vaccinated. We can create the category for people who are susceptible to the disease because vaccinations don't work 100%, but are vaccinated against it. And you can move from susceptible to susceptible but vaccinated. And then you can move from susceptible to vaccinated and because people who are vaccinated don't tend to become as sick as people who aren't, we can create an infective but vaccinated category. And we can just keep creating categories and drawing arrows that represent transitions between categories. So even if you have a sickness that is more complicated than this very kind of rudimentary three category model, the reason this model has been so influential, as I say, is that this basic idea, you have categories, people are shuffling around between categories, can be generalized to basically any illness, right? Um, it's not relevant to COVID, but if you're looking at sexually transmitted diseases, you might want to have different categories for men and women. Something like gonorrhea. If you're trying to model gonorrhea, you have to treat men and women separately because gonorrhea affects men and women separately. Um, men have painful symptoms and seek treatment quickly. Women do not show symptoms and therefore might not know they're affected and might not treat, seek treatment as a result. And you can do that. I mean, you can have an infect a susceptible male and a susceptible female category, and then infective male and infective female. And I don't believe gonorrhea grants any kind of immunity. So you just have these four categories, men and women, transitioning between being susceptible or being infective. So this basic idea is very powerful. And we will look at this kind of foundational model, the model that started all of this. And let's look at how the number of susceptible people changes over time. Our current year, I'll just write it down and then we'll discuss it. 
is going to be a negative RSI term. And here R is a constant. R is, I mean, some sicknesses obviously more in contagious than others. R is a constant telling you how contagious the disease is. The bigger R is, the more contagious the disease. We've got S times I because the only way this disease can be spread is for a susceptible person and an infective person to interact with each other. This disease we're imagining is spread from person to person contact. So S times I is the number of possible interactions. And R, in addition to um, the mod thing, how contagious the disease is, R is kind of storing how likely is it that people come into contact, stuff like that. Um, there's only a negative term here because in this elementary model, people cannot enter R, uh, enter S. People go from S to I, and they go from I to R, and then they stay in R forever. That's distinct from this uh, jury-rigged COVID model where people enter S, where people who have temporary resistance, temporary immunity, can then go back to being susceptible. Looking at the number of people in the infective category, well, people who leave S, so these people enter the infective category. Again, that's a property of the model. You, um, You cannot go from susceptible to removed without being infective first. And then people leave the infective category at a rate proportional to the number of infective people. Um, why delta? I. I mean, this is just reflecting the fact that if only a few people are infective, only a few people can recover. If a lot of people are infective, a lot of people recover. So the bigger I is, the uh, more people are leaving I. And this is really the SI model, the SIR model. And the objection that I'm forgetting a category, well, it's true, we do have a third category and a third differential equation. People who leave the infective people enter the removed category. However, these categories make up the entire population. So if you know how many people are susceptible and you know how many people are infective, then you can very easily calculate the number of people who are removed. 
Furthermore, notice that this removed variable doesn't appear in the S equation or the I equation. These first two equations are a self-contained system with two equations and two variables. So rather than have this third equation, we just look at the first two equations and then we can use subtraction to get R if we want it. And let's try to study this system of differential equations and let's see what kind of uh, what kind of techniques we can use to study this. And in spite of presenting this shortly after we talk about fixed points, um, fixed points aren't really going to be a useful tool here. And that's because so this was, there was a problem very similar to this on the test. I don't think anyone totally got it, um, where you have an entire line of fixed points. If I equals zero, that's always a fixed point. I equaling zero makes the first equation zero, it makes the second equation zero. And again, there was something like that on the test. I think it was the modified predator prey rat hunting thing where there was an entire line of fixed points. I, I can't remember. I think it was if all of the rats were wiped out, that was always a fixed point, something like that. Um, the downside of this is that um, these fixed points, because there's an entire line of them, aren't isolated. You have this line of fixed points. I can't think offhand if this should be vertical and horizontal, but either way, you have a line of fixed points you have some particular fixed point that you're interested in. Any circle you can draw around that fixed point includes an infinite number of other fixed points. So none of these fixed points are isolated. The Jacobian won't how we're going to study this system of differential equations. And this is a pretty standard trick. We're going to use it again before the end of the course is we're going to look at it parametrically. That is to say, we've got a variable S that is changing with R. And we've got a variable i that is changing with time. So this is parametric. Um, if you cast your mind back, we learned about parametric equations, at least at the end of Calculus 2. I don't know if Mr. Vogel used them at all in Calculus 3, or if they showed up elsewhere. But you've got, let me try to... You've got the axes and you've got the number of susceptible people and you've got the number of infective people. And as time passes, the number of susceptible and infective people is changing. However, it's changing. 
So this is parametric. Your two variables, S and I, are changing with respect to a third variable, I. And it would probably, probably be trying you unfairly to ask if you remember the derivative formed of those for parametric equations. Um, but the equation is that the derivative of y with respect to x, I mean, here we have s and i, but in calculus, we learned it in terms of y and x. The derivative of y with respect to x is the derivative of y with respect to t divided by the derivative of x with respect to t. Here we're going to treat the number of susceptible people as our x variable, and we're going to treat the number of infective people as our y variable. And we are therefore going to have di ds equals di dt over ds dt. And this parametric investigation, as I say, it's a very common trick. We're going to use it again when we look at models of armed conflict. Um, it works really well when you have a variable that is always decreasing. We're going to see that in armed conflicts when we look at attrition, loss of people over time. We're seeing it here where the number of susceptible people is always decreasing. And we'll see why it's so helpful that S is always decreasing momentarily. For now, let me just finish this string of equations because we know what the IBT is and we know what the SDT is. We're given these equations. RSI minus gamma I divided by minus R S I and ooh, this, this thing that I'm wearing keeps scratching up against the whiteboard. And this then we can rewrite as negative one minus gamma, over R S. Let's see. And this is a DI D S. And we have removed the third, or we have removed the parameter. We have removed time from our consideration here. We're looking at the relationship between I and S. And this differential equation, we can solve it. It's, um, it's separable. 
Yeah, it, it's separable because I and S are the only variables. I had a momentary pause, but it really is as simple as multiplying both sides of the equality by ds. And we can separate our variables in this way. I keep, the reason I keep pausing, I hate that we're using lowercase r because of course, capital R was something else. I keep thinking we have two variables and then having to remind myself, no, r is a constant. So sorry about that, but we've got our I variable alone on the left, and we've got our S variable alone on the right. And we can then integrate both sides. I know I said we were pretty much done with integration, but it's not not complicated integration here. I equals negative S plus gamma over R times the natural log of S. The number of susceptible people is always positive, so no need for absolute values. Thus, our constant of integration. And I hope this is pretty elementary calculus. Um, the derivative of a constant is the variable. So, sorry, the integral of a constant is the variable. So the integral of negative one became negative s. Then this negative gamma, that's just a constant. So it's going to stay Sorry. This negative sign and that negative sign give us addition there, not subtraction. So this gamma is a constant. It's just going to stay put when we take this integral. This R's a constant. It's just going to stay put when we take the integral. And then S is a variable. So one divided by S turns into the natural logarithm when we integrate. And now, then this might be trying you hard uh, to ask you to remember like, air resistant stuff, but you don't need to remember the details. You might remember that when we were looking at air resistance, we solved equations. And then we said, well, we don't want an arbitrary constant of integration. We'd rather have constants that mean something. And we're going to, um, we're going to do the same thing here. We're going to say at t is zero. So at the start of the outbreak, there were however many infective people there were. And there were however many susceptible people there were. So, I mean, this equation is always true, so it's true at the start of the outbreak. 
I zero equals negative S zero plus gamma over R times the natural log of S zero plus C. And now we're not going to do anything terribly clever or exciting. Um, we're going to solve for C. I zero plus S zero minus gamma over R times the log of S zero. And once we've solved for C, we're going to take it and we are going to stick it into that equation. And I'll copy the result on the next frame. The only thing that I think might require some comment is again, a natural logarithm, things we learn in algebra and then maybe don't do a lot with. Um, so gamma, when we plug this in for C, we're going to get the gamma over R, and then we're going to have an ln S minus an ln S zero. And on the next frame, I'm going to use the fact that one natural log minus another natural log can be written as a single natural log. And we're going up to a point to solve for I then. I equals negative S plus I zero plus S zero plus gamma over R times the natural log of S divided by S zero. Any sort of questions about the algebra? Then let's ask ourselves, what have we accomplished? What haven't we accomplished? Well, what we haven't done is gotten any temporal information. If I want to know the number of susceptible people um, five months into an epidemic, I can't get that from here because I've totally gotten rid of the time variable. What I have done is found a relationship between the number of susceptible people and the number of infective people. And let's graph this and let's see what kind of information we can get if we can't get this temporal time information. So I'm going to go to Desmos. And I will type this in and Desmos will give me a bunch of error messages because it's going to correctly say that it doesn't know what any of these S's and I's are supposed to mean. Um, instead of, let's see, let's use P. So notice here, 
that this gamma and this r, these two constants, the only place they appear is in this fraction. So gamma is a constant, r is a constant, and I'm just saying, okay, a constant over a constant is still just a constant. So plus P times the natural log of S divided by S zero. And let's stick some values in here. S zero, let's make S zero 10,000. I zero, let's make I zero 50. And finally, rho or P, let's make that 10. And here I'm going to use the fact that S is always decreasing. People do not enter the susceptible region. So if there were initially 10,000 susceptible people, there can only ever be fewer than 10,000 people in S. And I'm going to put a restriction, therefore, that S cannot be more than 10,000. And now I'm going to zoom out. And there's a limit to what I can do to this thing to make it look nice. I can go to the graph settings. X doesn't need to start at 17,000. Maybe that's maybe 10,000 is making it kind of hard to, maybe this row equals and is kind of making it hard there. That's that row start at a bigger number. Like that's that row be 5,000. So here's the picture. Here is 10,000 susceptible people. And when there are and 50 infective people and presumably zero recovered people because this is the start of the outbreak. So people haven't had a chance to be recovered yet. Well, because the number of susceptible people can only decrease we know what happens as time passes. As time passes, the number of susceptible people goes from right to left. And therefore, as time passes, we're tracing the curve out in this direction. And we don't have any temporal information, but that's not to say we can't say anything about the outbreak. So as time passes, the number of susceptible people is decreasing, the number of infective people is increasing, and we can make a prediction about how bad this outbreak will be at its worst moment. Our prediction is that the number of infective people reaches its maximum here with 1,584 or so people infected. And we then predict 
that the outbreak will decline and we predict that it will eventually go away. Yeah. And at the out, I mean, this outbreak ends when the number of infective people is zero. We obviously, we have to use a little common sense. The graph does continue, but we have to say to ourselves, no, the number of infective people can't be a negative. So, um, by the time this outbreak ends, because there are no infective people left, there are still about 2,000 susceptible people. So we're making predictions. We started out with 10,050 people, 10,000 in S, 50 and in I, and zero in R. The outbreak ends with about 2,000 people still in S. So we think of the 10,000 susceptible people, about 2,000 of them will get through the epidemic without being sick. Whereas, I mean, by elimination, if there are 2,000 people in S and zero people in I, the other 8,000 or so people must be in the recovered category. So we're making these predictions. We're making the prediction that um, about 80% of the population will get this sickness at some point. We're making the prediction that when this sickness is at its height, when things are at their worst, about 1,600 people will have the illness simultaneously. And we can then ask questions. Well, will our infrastructure, I mean, these of course were the questions people were asking during COVID. I, I, I never know, I hope it's not upsetting to talk about, but like people were asking questions. Well, are there enough beds in our hospitals? Do we have enough intensive care apparatus available for the number of people who are going to be sick at one time? And that's the kind of question we can answer just by looking at this graph, even though, as I say, we don't have any temporal information. We don't, just from looking at this graph, know when the outbreak will be at its worst, and we don't know when the outbreak will find the subside entirely. And if we did want that kind of information, we would use computer technology and Euler's method or something like Euler's method to investigate the model. That's not something we can really do by hand. Um, not every sickness turns into an epidemic like this. I mean, that was honestly really sort of shocked by COVID because growing up, I mean, I don't know if you got this, but growing up, it felt like every five years or so, there was some great epidemic that everyone was saying was going to take off, like various bird foods and stuff. And then they didn't. They all sort of just fizzled out somehow, at least in the American mainland, I should say. So I was quite surprised when, uh, when COVID sort of didn't do that. And it's all going to depend on this row. What happens to the epidemic? 
So when Ro, I started Ro at something small, something like 10 or whatever. And when I started Ro off small, it, we predicted a super severe epidemic where now of the 10,000 or so people in the population, about 8,400 of them are sick at the same time. And as I increased this row, the epidemic declined in severity. And if Rho increases enough, it won't be an epidemic at all. Now, epidemic is not as far as I know. I mean, maybe the World Health Organization has some formal definition somewhere. I'm not aware of a formal definition. But notice here, with Rho very large, with Rho at 1,001, the number of infective people does not grow as time passes. We start with 50 sick people, and then, I mean, new people can be getting sick. Here. Remember that there are recovered people. So just because the total number of infective people is going down, it doesn't mean new people aren't getting sick. It just means that people are recovering at a greater rate than people are becoming ill. But we started with 50 ill people and we never see more than 50 ill people. And that's the next thing I like to look at using this model. When will an epidemic occur. And because I'm not aware of a formal definition, I'm going to say that an epidemic occurs if I increases at any point. So going back to Desmos, I never increases, so this isn't an epidemic. If we decrease, come on, Desmos, faster. If we, if we decrease rho, now the number of infective people is initially going up. And this is what I consider to be an epidemic. And let's look at the derivative of I. Because if we want to know whether something is increasing or decreasing, you look at its derivative. We are not going to ask what's happening with respect to time though. So we're not going to look at di dt. Instead, we're going to look at di ds, how the number of infective people changes with the number of susceptible people. And it's a really simple derivative. Um, I prime of S is negative one plus rho over S. Um, I'm doing simplification here, like 
So when we take the derivative of the natural log, that will give us a negative one over S. So that's why we have an S in the denominator there. But when everything simplifies, we get a, quite a simple, um, quite a simple derivative. So, What happens if S is less than rho? So if S is less than rho, di ds is positive. If I if S is less than rho, the fraction rho over S is greater than one, and negative one plus something that's greater than one is a positive number. So this means that if we look at if we look at the relationship between S and I, the curve looks something like this. If the derivative is positive, the curve is increasing. So this says that as S increases, I increases, but since S never increases, a more useful way of thinking about this might be that as S decreases, I also decreases. So suppose, let's look at the number of susceptible people. Suppose the number of susceptible people at the start of the epidemic is less than a row. Where did I? Ah. Here we are. So as time passes, the number of susceptible people will decrease, right? So if the number of susceptible people is already less than a row at the start of the epidemic, and the number of susceptible people is only going down, then the number of susceptible people will always be less than rho during the, I use the word epidemic, let's say outbreak, then the number of susceptible people will always be less than rho during this outbreak. S is always decreasing. The number of susceptible people is always less than rho. So I is always decreasing. That's Let's just make the important point here. If S sub zero is less than rho, then I decreases during the entire out frame. The derivative is always positive. We have a graph that looks like this. Remember that X is the number of susceptible people. I is the number of infective people. 
Here's the start of the outbreak. As time passes, S is decreasing. So we're going from uh, right to left. The number of infective people is only going down. And in terms of what I have written on this frame, an epidemic is not occurring because the number of infective people I is never increasing. That sounds right to everyone. Now, by contrast, you might not write all of this down, but if S is greater than rho, this derivative becomes negative. So if S is greater than rho, the derivative is negative. So if a derivative is negative, the function decreases. So the curve looks like this. Right? And now let's think this through. Suppose that S sub zero is greater than rho. Because S sub zero is greater than rho, the derivative is negative and the curve will look like that. It will look like a decreasing curve. But as time passes, S is going down. Eventually, S will get to rho, and then S will be below rho. And now we're back in the case where the curve looks like this. We're back in the case where the derivative is positive. So once we hit rho, we now have an increasing curve and we'll see something like this. So if S sub zero is greater than rho, we predict an epidemic. Going back to Desmos, of course, I knew this ahead of time, which is why here, S sub zero, I'm holding at 10,000, and I'm looking at what happens as I change rho. And as rho increases, the epidemic becomes less and less severe. But it still is, if we zoom in, it still is an epidemic in the sense that the number of infective people is increasing for a while. until this magic number where rho reaches S sub zero, where rho is 10,001. And now there is no longer an epidemic. The number of infective people is decreasing only, just like we predicted. This has a number of interesting um, corollaries, I guess, implications is maybe a less uh, stuffy way of saying that. And I think intuitively, most people think that an epidemic will either get start or not start based on the number of infected 
active people at the start of the epidemic. Like if we can just keep people from coming into our country, or if we can just quarantine people or whatever, we can stop the epidemic. And that's obvious, I mean, that's obviously true up to a point. I mean, if there's an epidemic in France and we can literally stop anybody from coming into America who has ever been to Europe, that epidemic will have no way of spreading to America. That is true. But in general, whether an epidemic gets takes off or not, doesn't depend on the number of infective people, it depends on the number of susceptible people. For an epidemic to take off, you don't need a lot of people to be sick, you need a lot of people who are capable of becoming sick. And that's it's a shame that this has gotten so politicized, um, but that of course is the purpose of vaccinations. If somebody has been successfully vaccinated, the idea is that you're removing them out of the susceptible region. You can't really control Rho. Rho is whatever it is. But if at the start of an outbreak, you can vaccinate a bunch of people and remove them from the susceptible region. Okay, this is, this is looking weird because now S should be less than 30. Now S should be less than 3,100. There you go. If you can vaccinate a bunch of people and remove them from the susceptible category, then even though we can't change Rho, we can still prevent an outbreak from occurring. When there were 10,000 susceptible people, this value of Rho resulted in an outbreak. When we vaccinated a bunch of people and got the number of susceptible was down to 3,100, it no longer results in an outbreak. Um, this is called herd immunity. So that's the SIR model, or at least that's an introduction to the SIR model. As I say, there are, I mean, people are still publishing variations of this thing to this day. I mean, someone I knew in graduate school, blanking on the name of the disease, he was looking at some kind of parasite and I mean, he was not using the SIR model, but he was still using a variation of the SIR model. He had these categories, people who were susceptible, people who had the parasite, and he was still looking at a variation of this thing. I mean, and that must have been, what, six? years ago, seven years ago. So, I mean, for a model that was invented, I think in the early 1900s, incredible longevity. And again, that longevity comes from the fact that it's so easy to mess around with. Um, and I mean, of course, I always it sometimes feels like um, these mathematical models are very, very abstract, like the Richardson conflict model we looked at. Probably no one in the White House is making policy decisions based on that model. So it's nice to have 
an example where policy decisions can be made based on and are made based on mathematical predictions and mathematical biology. It, it's always nice to remember that the stuff you're doing is, is useful for, for something in the real world. I think I'm uh, going to let you go here, go now, and I will see you Thursday, and we'll keep on looking at uh, looking at models and analyzing models. I think think armed conflict on Thursday, Lancaster Square Law.